Possible Ghost Protocol, aka we finally thought of a cool nickname for that disavowing thing that seems to happen just about every movie, apart from the second one, but that only made that one less interesting. Ethan Hunt is back, San's wife, because, you know, she might have been a little bit difficult to ride around, but of course, you know, Omitting her does kind of make the entire third film feel pointless, more so than it already was. Anyway, he is being hunted by a Russian police officer something, I don't know, maybe like a government agent. It's not really made all that clear. Because something happened at the Kremlin, and the Russians are now suspecting America of having initiated an attack on them. So the entire IMF is now disavowed, and Ethan and his new team are the only, you know, the, the four people who can actually stop the bad guys who are as deadly as they are generic. They literally have no personality whatsoever. I'm gonna try to start with the good parts so that people who don't want all the details can just hear if this is something that they might be interested in watching or not. This is the best movie other than the first one in the series. Definitely. It is a proper spy thriller with pretty good action scenes. It's a very visual movie, it, definitely the most visual of all of them, and do remember one of these was directed by John Woo. It's a very intense film, very exciting. The plot does hold up pretty well. Again, you know, best since the first, because those two movies in this series are the only ones where the plot actually does really hold up the scrutiny. It's a pretty well-paced film. It never really, you know, stands still. And it does entertain pretty well throughout. The, the four agents all have actual character and personality. And, yeah, I suppose that's pretty much, well, and then there's the gadgetry. There's a pretty decent amount of gadgets, and they're, you know, cool and interesting and all. And, you know, not all completely credible, but this is, you know, this series has by now just created its own world where this sort of high-tech stuff actually exists. One of the things is actually this retinal thing that recognizes faces. And now Sawyer from Lost is an agent seen very early on. And apparently since leaving the island, his vision has gotten so bad that he now needs this retinal scanner in order to identify someone by their face, even though he's just seen their face. Yeah, I, you know, just because you can, you know, create some technology and use it doesn't mean you have to. It really doesn't. The, you know, the, the villains, at least the basic setup is slightly interesting. We have a kind of cool female assassin who's, you know, sufficiently threatening. And she and the female agent, Jane, have a chick fight. Or as I like to call it, a cleavage off. Jane is an interesting enough character. She feels guilty for the death of a fellow agent who she, you know, kind of sent out into the field. And that's actually a sort of 
you know, that's a theme explored here, and that basically is what lends this, you know, this entire movie a reason to exist, because otherwise it's really just a prototypical kind of straightforward spy action thriller with, you know, yeah, Ethan Hunt in it. It, it didn't have to be a Mission Impossible movie, it didn't have to be Tom Cruise, and, you know, yeah. Anyway, another thing that is quite good about this, you know, we do again have a sort of copy of, you know, the formula of the first movie, because that was actually a pretty good formula. With, you know, this one actually does have higher stakes than the first movie. And, you know, somewhat similar to the second movie. You know, higher stakes than that, but, you know, again, high stakes. And that's, you know, something, a movie like this, you know, it, it helps it quite a bit. You know, what, that's one of the problems with the third movie is that I'm not entirely sure what the stakes are. The, well, I suppose I should talk about the emotional core since I did for the second and third movie. It's very much present here. We do genuinely care about, you know, well, part of it is the stakes, which is kind of just, it's an easy way of getting us to care about what's going on. But other than that, we do genuinely like these characters, you know, or at least find them interesting enough that we want to see more of them. Anyway, getting back to the theme, the this kind of, you know, spies having to make life or death decisions and then living with those choices, having to actually, you know, go on even though you might have done something that, you know, and, and just, and the cost of being a spy. Explored here and a lot of the way nicely so. We have genuine, you know, emotions from our agents and they, you know, they're not superhuman, they're not perfect, they're not well-oiled machines all of the time, you know. So that makes them more relatable and that adds, you know, more tension because they could crack, you know, they're under a lot of pressure, it might, you know, and quite a lot The is, you know, at stake here, and it's all up to them, so that's quite nice. Now, the last two agents are Brant, Jeremy Renner, and he does quite well. The, the acting is all quite good, I'd say. And, yeah, there's, there's not an awful lot to say about him that doesn't give away something that, yeah, you know. I would say that the trailer kind of sets up this, you know, who are you really kind of thing, and I was actually thinking they were going to go back to something like the first movie where Ethan isn't entirely sure if he can trust the people he is, you know, working with, these agents, that he does have to trust with his life. They don't do anything quite that interesting, but I do like what they do with him, at least. Well, I'll get to that in the... Th the spoiler video. Now the final agent is Benji. Yes, Benji is a full-fledged agent now. Pretty much just because, you know, people thought he was funny in the third one for the 10 minutes maybe of screen time he had there. So they figured, hey, let's put him in the entire next movie. And yeah, it just, it's as expected, you know, it, just because he's funny for a little bit. I'm a Simon Pegg fan, it's not that, you know, I love Shaun of the Dead and Hot Fuzz and Spaced. But this is just not that, you know, they, they try way too hard at making him funny. Really, the humor and the dialogue are very hit and miss in this, you know, there are some great moments in there, but there are a lot that are just awkward and again trying way too hard and they just really should. this film is terrified of silence this film does not want to stand still for even 
two seconds, and that can be really distracting. It actually does manage to still get some genuine moments in there in between, you know, chasing and stuff like that, but yeah, and it does, you know, I like that they focus on tension so much, you know, it genuinely is these situations where you're afraid of someone getting caught and stuff like that. That's quite nice, instead of so much, you know, again, we're not going back to stuff like the second one where it's just a lot of shooting and explosions. But yeah, we have genuine, you know, it feels like a spy movie, you know, because there's really no reason for it to be a Mission Impossible movie if it's just going to be a straight action movie. The one thing that does work pretty well on this is that where the others somewhat are, Ethan is just the action hero and everyone else is just there, this one really has them working as a team and everyone has something important to do. And, you know, that's also a nice way to... Do raise tension because there are literally, yeah, at least a couple of scenes where everyone has something really important to do and if they mess it up then the whole thing is botched, you know, and yeah, so you have these, you know, different people under different circumstances all having to do something very important and it all has to work out, otherwise it's just not gonna work and that's very much I believe in the spirit of the original series you know it is not just one man against the world you know again then it might as well not be a Mission Impossible movie then why is it a person working for an agency you know but yeah so that's an aspect that works quite well Luther Stickle returns only in cameo form and yeah that's about it I think it's nice that they don't feel the need to you know, make a big deal. Although, you know, he does appear, so I guess, you know, they are obligated to put him in every single Mission Impossible movie. And speaking of that, they do, of course, bring back the person, you know, floating just above ground level. And again, it is not as interesting a scene as it was in the first one. I really wish they'd stop bringing it back. But at least this time, it's not Ethan, so... <laughs> points for that, I guess. It is a slightly interesting scene, though, at least. I suppose that pretty much covers it. There are some nice exotic locations in the film, far more than in the others. In fact, more than the others combined, I believe. Yeah, I believe that covers it. I've reviewed other parts of this series, the links are in the description box. Please rate and comment, and hey, if you like this video, that subscribe button's just waiting for you to click it.